I'm Joyce Hornady. You might say accuracy is my business. I make bullets. You are listening to the Hornady Podcast. Thanks for joining us and enjoy the show. All right, everybody, thanks for joining us on a, another podcast. And we've got some awesome guests today. Uh, and it is uh, an honor and a, and a pleasure uh, to be sitting with these guys here. Uh, I've got two gentlemen that have been instrumental to the company's success as a whole. Um, combined total, they've got about 85 years of work experience here at Hornady in various roles. Uh, and they've had their hands in a lot of projects. And uh, if you've ever used uh, Hornady products or the reloading manual or the reloading products, you've, you've definitely benefited from some of the work uh, that the, these two gentlemen have done. Obviously, they've seen a lot of changes over the years, uh, and we really wanted to sit these guys down and just pick their brain a little bit. So uh, these guys are not just Hornady workers, they're hunters and they're outdoorsmen, and uh, they've always been really willing to teach and to help. And uh, I think that's... Uh, that's characteristics that a lot of great men have. So I really appreciate them sitting down with me. Um, like I said, I'm honored to introduce onto the show today, Mike Jensen and Lowell Hawthorne. Guys, thanks for coming on the show today. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you. Absolutely. Yeah, it'll be fun. It should be. There's, there's a lot of knowledge here, a lot of uh, stories that may or may not be recordable that you guys have probably documented <laughs> <laughs> oh, over, yeah. over the years. So. As with any story, I like to start at the beginning, and uh, you guys have started uh, a while ago. Now, I need to preface that. If I say old timers, old school, anything referencing age, I mean that with all due respect. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, you guys, the, some, some old timers, been here for, for a while. If you guys talk, talk about when you guys started, maybe what year that was. Well, I started in uh, July of 75, 1975, walked into the plant. I mean, back then, you know, you just walk in and apply for the job. They sent me out on the floor and uh, said, go out. Joyce is out in the the shop there. You know, you walk out and there's this, there's this, he looked old to me. I'm I'm just a punk (laughs) kid out of high school, you know, just barely out of high school. But uh, uh, humble, uh, down to earth guy, you know, walk up to him and shaking in my boots, and he's he's basically easy to talk to. Hires me on the spot, says, "Can you show up next week?" And and next thing you know, here I am, you know, after that. But but quite a guy, a guy that you could never rattle, you know. I just there's so many. I got so many things that I've seen in the short time that I, uh, that I knew him, you know, before he, before that plane crash. But that's, that's something I've heard about Joyce Hornady a lot of times from a lot of different people that he was cool as a cucumber, steady. You couldn't get him riled up. He wasn't going to scream at you. Uh, that must've been, uh, yeah, the, something that he had in spades. Yeah. He, we, uh, just for example, you know, and of course it's always been, and they always, always encouraged employees to use and, and right, the product and what have you. But, uh, so of course, you know, you, you, you generally ask, you know, and, and ask if you could have some ammunition or bullets and stuff like that. Well, we wanted one boy in, in particular and at Joyce, was one of these guys that had to be at the time clock. If he was in the shop, he was at the time clock to greet you when you left. You know, shake your hand, say good night, see you tomorrow. Inevitably, if he was in town, he had to where he was at. Well, one day we come walking up, and one of the one of the young guy, he's not with us anymore, but <laughs> he come in there with a sack of bullets in a in a paper bag and come walking up to the time clerk and lo and behold that sack breaks and the bullets hit the floor and and they just i could just see the bullets slide around behind uh joyce's feet you know never rattled him just bent over started picking them up grabbed a box started filling the box up 
handed them to him. Good night. See you tomorrow. Wow. <laughs> it was, uh, you know, it was, you would have thought he would have realized he was kind of sneaking them bullets out, but but it was. Didn't rattle him at all. Didn't rattle him a bit. So July 1975, Lowell, when did you get started? Uh, September of 1980. 1980, so you got to meet Joyce as well. Uh, I did uh, several times. Um, Joyce, I started on night shift, on, on a bullet press on night shift, and Joyce would come out occasionally, and he would walk around and and talk to everyone that was on the floor, you know, just to see how things were going, you know. Um, very nice man. That's didn't didn't get to see him very, very often, you sure. know. Um. When I started, I interviewed with Dale Franzen, who was the plant manager at the time, interviewed and took me out on the press row and he showed me, you know, what these, what these machines are doing here. And he says, asked me, do you think you could handle this? And I, I'm looking at it and I'm going, I have no idea what's going on here, but <laughs> yeah, I can do it. Right. I can do it. He's, and back in the office and Dale says, can you start next Sunday? You know, we're working Sunday evenings to start. and. Uh, Yep, I can I can do that. So I walked in Sunday evening, didn't know anyone in the plant. Uh, walked in and the night shift supervisor at that time greets me at the time clock. You know, I had no idea where I'm supposed to go or who I'm supposed to talk to, and he wanted to know what I was doing there. There's nobody had to, nobody had told Ron <laughs> that, that I was starting that night. So so it a uh, little bit of a slow start, but it turned out all right. That's that's cool. So you were making bullets. Why do you, what uh, what did you start out doing? I started in as a bullet press bullet operator. Press operator. Yeah. So it's, in 1980, we were obviously running a night shift then. I didn't know uh, when that, obviously our bullets are in ridiculous demand right now, but uh, several decades ago, uh, if we were justifying a night shift, sounds like we were. Do you guys sure. remember what bullets you first made? That was a funny, funny story because Mike and I ran the same presses. Yeah, he ran them on day shift, and I ran them on night shift. Oh so. my gosh, <laughs> that's what is that's how we got, how we met actually. Yeah. That's that's pretty incredible. Do you remember what bullet that was? The uh, boat tails on the on number one, like two seventy one forty mm-hmm. boat tails, I believe. Yeah, fire points, my yeah, fire point, fire point uh, interlock bullets. Yeah, interlock bullets. Yeah, that's that's pretty cool. And so I I just made a reference, and I apologize for the listeners, Mike. I've always known you as Whitey, but again, I've only been here for eight years. <laughs> when, when did you get that nickname? Have you always been Whitey? I've, I, you know, I had that nickname even when I was a kid, even in Boy Scouts, when I was in Boy Scouts, they, I don't know how I got that hung on me, but of course now I got no hair, but so you can't hardly tell. But, but when I started, I had long blonde hair down past my ears you know, kind of, mm-hmm. and, uh. So that's, I think, I'm not sure who hung that on me at okay. work actually right now, but, but. Mike Wright, possibly. Yeah, it might've been, might've been Mike Wright, maybe in the, one of the lab guys. One of the lab guys. All right. So if I reference Whitey, that's, that's Mike Jensen. That's how I was introduced to yeah. him as. And, and, and there's still a lot of people that, that don't know my real name. <laughs> <laughs> they'll, they'll come up and I uh, was sitting at the table one time at one of the, at one of the uh, Christmas parties, and there's they brought up my name at the at the at the front at the counter up there when they, Steve was talking about something that we had done anyway. Uh, but there was two or three of them at the tables, like who's Mike Jensen, <laughs> and I'm sitting there with them at the table. <laughs> All they knew be by was Whitey. Okay, all right. So you've always been Whitey. That's 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 good to know. <laughs> Uh, so it's, it's, yeah, 1980, uh, making bullets. We're obviously running a night shift. Was the overall feeling of, of working at the company in that time? I mean, were we really, uh, expanding and moving quick? I mean, I, I, I don't, I know now when I started in 2013, things were going a hundred miles an hour and we couldn't make enough then, but what was it like in 1980? It, it was a, it was a slower, slower time and we were busy. Uh, all of the machines were going, you know, everybody was busy at the time, but it was mm-hmm. uh, not the volume, obviously, that we're doing nowadays. No. And we loaded ammo at that time as well, correct? We did, yes. Yeah. 
Yes, we did. And we had the uh, Pacific Reloading Tools. The tool, the tool, and uh, yeah. So we had all three divisions right there connected in Grand Island. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so if anybody who's been to the factory uh, in Grand Island, you've seen uh, a big building that's just been added on to. So it's all under one roof now, but at the time, uh, it was a smaller building, and then we kind of added on here yep. and there, and eventually they all became under one roof. But to have the reloading tools and the ammunition and the bullet production all under one roof in that small of a footprint must have been uh, a little bit of a slower time. Yeah, at that time, I don't remember exactly what, maybe 100 employees, something like that yeah, around there. I think when I started, it was even less than that. It was yeah. probably like closer to 50. Wow. I so started. everybody parked in the same parking lot and I mean, mm-hmm. you can't do that anymore. No, not even close. Everybody clocked out at the same clock, time clock, you know, it was one door out, one door in, or out basically was what you used. Yeah, that's wild. So when you guys got started, was there a draw to work for Hornady because it was either a great employer or because it was hunting and shooting related and you like to hunt and shoot or what, what drew you to Hornady? Was it just a job or? Well, when, when I started, I I had been working for another company and I got laid off two different times, you know, downturn in business. So they lay the lower tenured employees off. So I didn't want to do that again. So I'm looking around and, and I saw an ad in a magazine. It was just a small ad at that time in one of the shooting magazines and Hornady Manufacturing, Grand Island, Grand Island, Nebraska. Really? I had no idea that they even existed at that time. So I went in, applied for the job and here I am. Awesome. So you were obviously a shooter if you were reading a, a shooting magazine. I, I was. I was into hunting, yes, yeah. Awesome. What about you, Mike? I was uh, working as, at first, as a plumber apprentice with a guy. And it was pretty obvious that I really wasn't into plumbing. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I was looking for manufacturing, and I knew there was New Holland was... And uh, and Hornady was one of the only two manufacturers to speak of in Grand Island at the time. So I walked in, went to New Holland first and Hornady second, and they hired me on the spot. So uh, here I am. Awesome. And were you a shooter at that time? I um, primarily uh, at that time, my dad was a big upland game bird hunter, so okay. pheasant quail. Mm-hmm. So I was an avid bird hunter, but hadn't done uh, my my uncle introduced me to deer hunting. Okay, and I uh, so right about the time that I started at work in Hornady, fortuitous timing. So basically, that's I got started into deer hunting and and that kind of thing when I started at work at Hornady. That's that's pretty cool timing and that it worked out that way. Yeah, Nebraska in the mid seventies, if you were a pheasant hunter, was a pretty cool place to be. Yeah. Um. So yeah, we had. We had our share of uh, pheasant hunting opportunities here, which we've seen uh, kind of decimated in recent times. But uh, nonetheless, yeah, I've heard a ton of stories about the the pheasant population that was, uh, yeah, my dad graduated high school in the 70s and on the family farm, they could walk around the section with a single shot 410 and bring enough pheasants home to feed mom and dad and 17 kids. <laughs> and uh, it's just ridiculous yeah. to think that they were that thick at one time yep. so that's that's cool that you guys were were right on the cusp of really starting to hunt and shoot uh deer hunting obviously is is huge in the midwest um bullet wise we made accurate bullets that's that was you know everybody knows yeah. if you know hornady that was joyce's goal was was yes. accurate bullets so um you guys learned to make accurate bullets and uh I don't th- I'm not sure how to articulate uh, to give the listener the right perception of what it takes to make a bullet. To just make a bullet, go through the transfer press and come out looking like a bullet, but let alone to shoot uh, to the accuracy standards that we have. How long did it take you guys to really get good at dialing those things in? Because it's an art form. It, it is. It is. Uh, yeah, honestly, I don't remember. You know, working on night shift, uh, we didn't do a lot of that on night shift. Yeah. We were mostly tasked Production. with running running machines that were already set up to go. Okay. So. Yeah. so, yeah, during the day shift was when, you know, that's when the tool room was all there and what have you. And, and other other support was yeah. there. And the lab was open. So, and the lab was open. So 
that's when we did most of the trying to set them up and get them dialed in and what have you. But yeah, of course, concentricity was one of the main issues. And then you, you know, that's a, that's the basis of getting a, a bullet to shoot accurate is, yep. is making sure you've got good draw, good, good cup but all, all the way through to, to the very end. But the accuracy is, is a key. Yep. It's in, like Whitey just said, the concentricity, how concentricity. perfectly round we can make that bullet from. The, it starts as a copper cup and all the way to, to the end until it's a finished product, keeping the dies and punches in perfect alignment uh, to get that thing perfectly uh, circular helps to, to make good accuracy. So we have, as, as a company, I say we, Hornady, uh, one of our big in, in, inventions, if you will, now, early was called the inner groove bullet, which helped lock the jacket to the core under expansion because Joyce wanted to make accurate bullets, but he was making hunting bullets. These okay. weren't just pumper pa paper punching bullets. Right. Uh, he was making hunting bullets. And so in 1977, um, that's when the inner lock bullet was released. And we still make a lot of bullets with an inner lock ring. So that technology that's, gosh, you know, 40 40 some mm -hmm. years old that we're still using today and that's that mechanical barb essentially that locks the jacket to the core do you guys remember uh and, or have any involvement with that that technology when we started that uh, that was before i started okay. so yeah that was uh i mean chuck schreiber there was we didn't have a we don't have near the you know back then we had a couple of engineers chuck schreiber and and I think Melvin Holmes was uh, was a key there, but but as far as uh, you know, the, a lot of the development and stuff come from the tool room and from guys on the floor. As far as that goes, though, so it wasn't it wouldn't be the first time that some of that was developed there. But I'm not sure. It probably had something to do with Tw Chuck Schreiber, I imagine. Okay. With, uh, the uh, the inner groove in there. Sure, and that that inner lock. Um, anytime you add a feature like that to a projectile, uh, it adds a level of complexity to keeping that bullet perfectly concentric. And you just mentioned concentricity being uh, so huge for accuracy. Sure. So to, to do something like that, to, to get that geometry on the inside of a bullet jacket, uh, pretty monumental to still maintain our accuracy standard. Yeah, the thicker the jacket is, and then you have to create a little bit thicker area in order to control the expansion, uh, and especially down on the bottom so that you have material to roll in and of course the thicker the jacket is and the heavier it is the harder it is to get concentricity so it it takes a little more yeah that's uh that's something more. i'm it's it just kind of blown away by that that a a small thing like that can be so difficult to manufacture but a small thing like that can be so monumental that we're still using it in 2021. Yeah. Our most premier hunting bullet that we offer, the ELDX, features an interlock ring, and that's that's pretty cool that uh, you were around to to see that developed. And and Lowell, even you know that was developed what three years before you started there, but that's still ground level when you you know realize that it's been in production for. 40 some years there's that's, still a lot of people that swear by the old interlock design too absolutely with the exposed mm -hmm. lead tip yeah it's killed a, I don't even want to know how many animals that 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 bullet design has has taken yeah. so yeah that's that's cool so it's 1980 1981 you guys are running the same press coincidentally <laughs> um and then the the history of Hornady as it goes unfortunately uh headed to shot show Joyce Ed Hears and Jim Garber um, tragically killed in a in a plane crash headed to Shot Show. Uh, if you guys remember what that was like, how you got the news, and and kind of what the the state of the company was immediately following that so that's such a tragedy. No, we had uh, immediately after immediately after it happened, we had a meeting with uh, uh, Dale Franton, who was the plant bullet plant manager at that time, and in, informed us and. It was a very somber moment. I mean, Joyce was, was a great guy, and yeah. to lose the head of the company, uh, just, it was devastating. Yeah, it was, it was quite a shock. And I would, I'd, I'd talk this over with Steve Hornady uh, as well, but I want to get your guys' uh, kind of thoughts on it from the employee side of things. 
uh, you know, as an outsider looking at that situation, I could see you have the the founder and the president and and one of the one of the innovative minds of a company tragically killed. I could see where the family trying to rebuild might find it easier and less burdensome to sell the company to somebody else, but they didn't. And when you guys uh, heard that news and, and the, the days and weeks following, was that a concern of yours that, that Steve wasn't going to become president and they were going to sell it and maybe your jobs were at risk or not, not in my mind. No, no, you know, I was pretty confident that it would keep going under, under family management. No, it, it wasn't. Uh, uh, Steve was always involved in, in the, in the plant. I mean, he was off to college and off in that, and that too, but, but as long as I remember and before I was there, Steve was involved in with the company, you know, hands on and everything too. So he was, it's not like, it's not like he was just freshly thrown at it at mm-hmm. the end. Yep. That's, that's something that, uh, I hope our, our customers and listeners and, and, uh, people that just enjoy Hornady as a whole understand that, that the, the family roots of the company are incredibly deep and, the easy road may have been to sell the company at that time, but Steve was already involved and was not just the owner and not just signing paychecks, but he was, he may not have been on the floor as much as Joyce from what I understand, but he was uh, intimately involved with the company and wanted to take care of its employees who had taken care of the company. And that's, I think, a, a, a pretty neat thing. Uh, now, you know, when back then there may have been a hundred employees, but now when you've You've added so many employees and the customer base has grown exponentially and we're sold around the world. The fact that we're still family owned, we've been family owned, we're going to stay family owned is is pretty cool. Um, I'm not sure how many of our listeners get to enjoy working at a company that is family owned, but uh, I can say it's it's pretty damn cool when the owner, you know, sees you coming down the hallway, stops, says hi, asks how things are going. And and genuinely cares about yeah. the answers to the questions, not just saying them. That's that's pretty cool. Yeah, and I mean Steve, he he uh, he tries to get he tries to get to know everybody. I mean it's it's gotten I it has to be a a heck of a, ta- a heck of a cha- uh, challenge to do that. Mm-hmm. But even by handing out paychecks and stuff like that, he tries to move around and and do different departments. Even to this day, you know, uh, even even till recently, I guess we're doing mostly electronic now. But but uh, I think that was one of the reasons why, when they were still handing out paper checks and yeah. and invoice or stubs, that uh, he wanted the employee picture on the stub so mm-hmm. he could put this this paycheck with this person. Yep, I remember that when I was uh, freshly employed, my first pay stub that I got. Steve Hornady delivered it to my desk and, uh, yeah, and asked how I was liking it and how I was settling in. And I yeah. just was blown away that, cause to, to me, I grew up shooting Hornady products. So to me, in my mind, Hornady is this giant, you know, corporation and whatever, but yeah. in reality was it's, it's not that way. And it wasn't that way then. And, uh, yeah, that's pretty cool that he, for yeah. a lot of years, I mean, yeah, marched around to yeah. every employee. Yeah. If, if he if he was in the plant, if he was home, he generally handed out the paychecks to everyone. Yep, that's uh, that's just cool. It's been uh, it's been neat to see his involvement stay as 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 involved as it has uh, with with Jason coming in on as the vice president. Uh, to, to, yeah, Steve's still in the office, and he's not just in there reading emails. He's he's working and, and has a hand in decision making and that's that's pretty cool so um there's been a, a ton of product involvement between where we just left off you know right after uh joyce and ed and jim were, were tragically killed until let's say i started in 2013 a yeah. lot of new products in there and when i started in 2013 lowell you were in the ballistics lab and mike you were uh i have no idea what but you were a <laughs> the most gifted machinist I've ever seen run a lathe. You were, uh, first time I met you, you were doing some R and D stuff on, uh, our GMX, our monolithic bullet. Um, so not running bullet presses at all. What happened, uh, in those years that, that led you up to, 
to, like I said, maybe 2013 time frame when I started. Well, I worked as a press operator quite a number of years, 15 years or so, and then moved into uh, a kind of a uh, problem solver, helping uh, other people moving around uh, and basically a, just to help other people do it and be successful at their presses and what have you. And then uh, a bit later, moved into the tool and die and started working as tool and die and learning that process, but but also stayed involved with helping people with problem solving out there. And then I, and then I brought up that some new products and some stuff came from, you know, people that worked in the tool room and the floor, as far as that goes. I mean, uh, of course we, we were limited on how many engineers we had because, uh, with, uh, Chuck Schreiber and, and Melvin and they had their hands full just trying to get stuff. So anyway, basically, uh, after that, I, I basically worked with the tool and die for quite a number of years and then moved into the helping basically with engineering so as to help with all the new engineers that we were getting. I basically worked with those guys as a kind of as a lazy on between the press operator or press bro and the, okay. and the, and the, taking their ideas, taking their designs and, and stuff, and then in, and helping implement them on the press yep, that's, and, and making uh, things flow. And Yep. That sounds like a, like you said, a liaison between, uh, we have a product idea, but a lot of the newer engineers weren't familiar with how to run a bullet press. And we have a guy like you that intimately knows how to run a bullet yep. press and you could help with the tool and die design. Yep for between engineering and actually making yeah. a product that performs sure. like they had it thought that's that's pretty cool it's a that's a a long and kind of windy path to to where you're at and it's amazing to me that you are a apparently self-taught machinist well i took a little bit of machine shop in in school and stuff like that but not a lot yep. so uh, yeah basically self-taught for anybody that's listening i can't describe to you the patience that's exuded to watch this guy run a lathe <laughs> and the, the, the things he's been able to build and manipulate and construct using a mill and a lathe is it, it's borderline mind blowing. <laughs> uh, it's probably a podcast yeah. in and of itself, so we won't go down that rabbit hole. But, uh, if there's every, ever anything with metal that needs to be done, you go see Whitey and he can, he can get it done. So that, <laughs> appreciate that as yeah, for on behalf of everybody at Hornady <laughs> that's ever had anything done, I yeah, publicly well, say thank you. Well, there's a lot of other guys in there that, yeah. that are very good. That's not just me. Yeah. But most, most of the special stuff is taken to you though. I mean, if I well, have a problem or, you know, something like that, it, uh, if they got, if they got a, the engineer got a idea of a punch there or something that he needs ground or, or made and he's not sure if it can be done or something like that, then he's like, well, we'll get together and we're like, well, let me see if I can make one. Mm -hmm. I'll just see if I can, you draw me a picture of what you want <laughs> and I'll see if I can, if I can make it or figure out a way to make it. And then if it, you know, whether it's grinding flutes or different mm -hmm. types of details on, on punches or, or other, or other, other metal work, you know, I'll try to, which, yep. Don't know he's going along real well with the guys in the grinding room because they uh, they kind of they kind of look at me like really yeah you really you you go ahead and make this now I got to make this yeah <laughs> well that's uh but we find better newer and better ways of doing it than when I than what I do old school so yeah it's still cool and and you you gain that level of confidence and competence through experience and I've said this before I think I've said this on the podcast that. One of the, the neat conceptual ideas that, uh, that one of my buddies, Miles Neville, as you guys know, you know him, uh, yeah. he's one of our, our engineers, uh, he said, you can condense knowledge by reading, learning, uh, focusing your attention on a specific task, and you can take 
years of knowledge and condense it and somebody can learn it really quickly. But what you can't condense down is experience. You, you, you can't, that's not, it's a non-condensable item and you only get experience through experience yeah. uh, and through time. And, and that's, that's cool. So, uh, Lowell, let's, uh, let's, let's get back to, uh, when you kind of made a transition or what your transition looked like, because you're, you're still in the ballistics lab. And when did that, uh, when did that transition take place? And was there any other, uh, stops for you along the way? No, it was pretty much straightforward. Uh, like I say, I worked night shift for a while. Um, we slowed down a little bit, so they took everybody to days, no layoff or anything. Everybody went to days and we did that for a while again. Business picked up a little bit. So back to night shift again, did that for period of time and and i think it was maybe 1985 right in there or something uh one of the guys in the ballistics lab was moving on to another company so there was an opening i applied and uh fortunately got the job you know 35 or more years later 35 years 36 years whatever it is uh you to do you have any idea how many rounds you have fired is would there even be a way to calculate it no no idea i wouldn't it's mind-boggling i wouldn't even attempt to yep so everybody that uh that that thinks uh shooting guns and and ammo would be a fun job uh it's still a job but you got to uh, pull the trigger and uh and fire some rounds many many times over A, a lot a lot of rounds and contrary to what a lot of people think shooting guns all day long is not always <laughs> great. Yeah, yeah, I uh I can remember some some times where I had to accuracy test things like 416 Ruger from the shoulder. Oh yeah. And uh I I suppose in 36 years you probably uh yeah, maybe have like a a weird way of holding your body because you've rearranged your shoulder enough times. We used to always look for volunteers when we're shooting big things yeah. like that, yeah. Who can we sucker into doing this? <laughs> So you, you started uh, there in 1985 in the ballistics lab. When did you start or was it kind of immediate? Um, you know, we've, we've always had the Hornady handbook of cartridge reloading. Uh, when did you start doing the, some of the, the data for that? Was that just something that was rolled into part of the job in the ballistics lab? It was. We weren't doing a lot of it at the time. Uh, when, I, when I started in the lab, there was uh, me and, and Bob Palmer. So there were two of us in the lab. Uh, so it, it, we weren't nearly as busy at that time. We did all of the, between the two of us, all of the bullet testing, accuracy testing for the bullets and all of the, the P and V testing for the ammunition at the time. And we did a lot of the, uh, customer service phone calls too. Oh, and wow. Even, even that there were, you know, very few calls during the day. So somebody would call and need a load for, for whatever, or, you know, wonder which bullet to use. So we, we'd do that too. So we were kind of jack of all trades and mix in a little bit of handbook data at the time too so that kind of transition as we got busier you know add add more cartridges you know things that we actually developed and introduced so you have to do all of that and then Mm -hmm. you know everybody else in the industry is trying to trying to stay on top and introduce new things too so it kind of snowballed along as we went from 1985 to our most current 11th edition handbook i it's probably almost doubled in size uh, but so anybody that's listening who's opened a Hornady handbook of cartridge reloading, probably going back to the fourth edition, somewhere in there. Yeah, fourth I or fifth. Don't remember. Nineteen eighty, eighty one, or eighty five would have been when I started down there. So I, honestly, I couldn't tell you which which edition it would have been. So f- probably the fourth or fifth edition. If you've uh, opened one of those and and looked at reloading data, there's a good chance that this man sitting right here. Uh, at least uh, had to check it, shoot it, develop it, uh, and you compound that by all of the manuals we've done since then. And uh, that's that's no small feat, and that's a, a pretty cool thing to hang your hat on, uh, that that the hundreds and thousands or millions of people who have opened that manual um, have benefited from your work. That's yeah. among many others, but that's that's a pretty cool thing. That's like I said, that's something to, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm the guy to blame if you're 30-06 load in the book. Well, that's way too low. I mean, yeah. why, why didn't he go to 70 grains? Yeah. You know, that, that's me. Okay. Well, <laughs> uh, in the, in the essence of safety, appreciate, uh, appreciate your efforts. 
Uh, so that's that's cool. And that brings us kind of to, for like I said, maybe up to 2013 until present day. So now, uh, Mike, you're still the, the in, you work for engineering as kind of yeah. an R&D yeah. tool and die, sure. uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Mike, over these last, I don't know, couple decades or so, doing the, the kind of the liaison and R&D type of thing, is there a project or two or a, a product or two that really stick out as, as maybe one of your highlights that, that you got to help work on? Well, the first one that would, that would probably highlight that I worked pretty directly with was the XTP bullet line. Okay, the pistol bullet line. Pistol bullet line. That's when, uh, that was the beginning. Of course, that's been quite, that's been the Since early the 80s. 80s mm-hmm. Yeah, in the middle 80s. So, uh, of course, that bullet was a short jacket with the lead exposed on the, uh, early on, mm-hmm. that, that pistol bullets. And uh, one of the guys in, in, and I was working in the tool room, and I was still on the press road then. And uh, basically... We had a 454 Casul from Freedom Arms come in, and I wanted to, uh, we wanted to build a bullet for it, for one, so, and we weren't really supposed to be messing with it, because uh, the plant manager at the time wanted us to focus on other stuff, but, but, uh, but you messed with it anyway. (laughs) He was gone for a few days, we, uh, we hurried up and built a bullet that with the jacket that went all the way around the front, serrated the front nose. We even, I think we even put an interlock in one of them, but, uh, we developed this bullet that went around the nose and then, and, uh, presented it to, and well, we, we made the bullet, we made the tooling, we made the bullet, we went down and we tested it. It expanded really great. Great. So then, showed it to Steve when he got back and which which kept us from getting into trouble because <laughs> Steve's like, Well man, I think we can put this on the whole line. So and that's where the basically the start of that was Wow. That's crazy. And then we started developing that. So we worked with building nose bullets throughout that whole line there. hmm And that's so, that's huge for a lot of reasons. The semi auto loading pistols, for example, you get that exposed lead tip like a lot sure. of the old jacketed hollow points had that thing gets boogered up the expansion becomes unreliable yeah. they probably don't want to feed uh they slow i'm sure it slowed the expansion on the 454 casul and some of those other yeah. giant revolver cartridges yeah well i wanted one of those so that's why i was i was kind of <laughs> eager to do it <laughs> necessity and you, and you got one too didn't you i do got one yeah, necessity is the one. mother of invention you yeah. needed a bullet for the casul so you made one yeah and then uh the the next, the next big, of course, we had, you know, the SST line and all of the VMAX and all of those lines, you know, worked, worked with those designs and those lines with engineers across that. But probably the, probably the best, one of the, the most fun line that we were, that I worked with is the, the GMX line, the GMX with uh, Jeremy Millard and Jeremy Millard was Oh man, he's a he's really talented engineer, young kid, uh, but smart as a whip. And that guy, uh, I, I worked with him to try to develop that line, and that was that's that was the biggest, probably the hardest line that it took to get going. Okay, what were some of the challenges there? And and so uh, GMX, that's a Copper, zinc, alloy, no lead core, just 100% right. homogenous right. material. Right. What was some of the hurdles there? Well, at first we started with just pure copper type thing, you know, and we, we, you know, just trying to get a cavity built in there. We, of course, the, the goal was to, to run it from, you know, from the start all the way across to a finished bullet out of the one press. So that, you know, the goal was to have a, finished product in one press without having to take it off and do something and and put it back on operations and and all that stuff so so yeah they it's that material's not easy to move and uh, we we got that to move we got the copper to go and we got we had pretty started getting where we thought we knew what we how to do it and then uh 
of course then steve threw a wrench in it at that about that time he says well that's all fine and dandy but we got to have it out of this gilding metal stuff because i don't i don't like the copper so so the pure copper so we went to gilding metal which we started all over again you mm -hmm. know and, and it was a whole new ball game but yeah it's it's tough to move that material around yeah. and it's to get it to do what you want and then to put the the controlled expansion into it and learn how to develop that so that it you could actually perform you could basically design <laughs> with the controlled expansion with the flutes whatever we put into it and uh, control that expansion at whatever velocities we were tasked with that's that's cool and so the addition of uh, zinc to copper that's where we get the quote-unquote gilding metal um, did the zinc do anything for us from a manufacturing standpoint is it is it more uh did it add lubricity did it move a little bit easier than pure copper yeah i think with the barrels with the through the guns and stuff i think the i think it's uh it works better than uh, pure copper it's less less apt to foul okay as, as much and that's yeah that's a monumental hard bullet, yeah monument monumental project because that's that's a huge bullet line for us and there's a lot of people yeah. that have have taken who knows how many animals yeah. uh, with that and, and all those challenges to, to design that bullet all while it has to shoot accurately too it's not like it just has to expand it still has to shoot accurately and yeah. anytime a material resists moving um you need it to move at the same rate so you can keep your concentricity yeah. i could see where that would be a tough yeah, one it's like i said with uh, even with a, a cup and core bullet with a cup Mm -hmm. You know, you, when you're making a, using a heavier cup, it's, it's more, it's harder to make concentricity with a heavier cup than it is with a lighter cup. That's why your match bullets are much easier. Mm. But, uh, but, and same goes for with this, you know, if you're moving, now you're moving a solid mass. So it's, it really gets difficult. Although we have got a process that helps us to be able to control concentricity at the beginning at, from the beginning all the way through awesome well that's the xtp the gmx line obviously a host of other things uh, in between here and there but uh, that's that's some pretty good highlights now lowell i'm interested to hear your thoughts on maybe some projects that 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 are your cool to work on because we've hit uh you know to fill our own bucket we've hit some home runs here in the last handful of years but uh, the 300 PRC, the 65 PRC, the 6 Arc, the 65 Creedmoor, um, and that's only going back just a little bit. And you go back even further: the 17 HMR, the 204 Ruger, the whole Lever Evolution line, uh, the the FTX bullet with our Lever Evolution uh, line of ammo, uh, super performance. Uh, you know, an internal ballistics uh, problem there is you know creating super performance that doesn't increase pressure but increases the velocity. Um, what what projects? that went on in the ballistics lab that that you might have found as most meaningful? Well, basically the, the new cartridge designs, you know, we had uh, back in the day, Dave Emery did a lot of, a lot of the design on some of that stuff. He introduced the 204 Ruger, the light Magnum, heavy Magnum oh, yeah. line. I forgot about that. You know, the increased velocity back in the day, mm -hmm. uh, revolutionary. And the 204 lever revolution, uh, a lot of that stuff uh, just came out of Dave's mind, you know. He wanted to work on this project, and he'd get started on it on his own. And, mm -hmm. you know, we'd be doing pressure and velocity testing with, you know, trying different powders and that, and then uh, um, just kind of went on down the line. So, like you say, there's been a lot of, not uh, toot our own horns, but there's been a lot of home runs mm -hmm. down the line. So, Is there... Uh... <clears throat> A time that you may have been just a normal day, a couple years ago, maybe a couple hours ago, maybe, and you get a test to go, and you're going to go test this ammunition for pressure and velocity, and it's a six five Creedmoor, and you set it up, and you run the test, and everything's great, and you stop to think, like, do you did did you think that the six five Creedmoor, just to pick on that one, you know, over a decade now, did you ever think when you were testing the 6.5 Creedmoor for pressure and velocity or whatever you're doing with it early on, that one day it would be 
the popular cartridge that it is. Did anybody think it would be? I, I hope I, so. I, I honestly, I don't know. I don't. You know, it was kind of yeah. introduced as a as a uh, uh, target cartridge to begin with. Mm-hmm. You know, we had the 140 grain loaded with H4350, and then the 120 grain loaded with Varget. So, I mean, that was what it was really intended to. You know, be a, a cartridge that people could buy factory ammunition for and be competitive with, Mm -hmm. you know, which there wasn't a lot of that out there. Sure. That's true. So, uh, you know, it, it didn't take off right away. I mean, it, it, it sold and sold and then people got to shooting it, you know, more and more people got to shooting it. And you see a lot of people just came to the realization that, yeah, this is not only is the factory ammunition better than almost anything out there, but, you know, we can hand load it too. And, you know, the, the, the possibilities are almost endless with bullet selection powder and that. So, yep. you know, that Creedmoor is, there's a few haters out there, but I think that's mainly because of the success it's had. Yep. I, I would have to agree. I actually uh, did a small interview uh, for some article about why people uh, love to hate the 6.5 Creedmoor. And, mm-hmm. and I, they don't hate it for its merits. They hate it because of how successful it is and how many people uh, jumped on and how many fanboys there are and exactly yeah that that's uh that's cool well i just thought of this while you were talking i don't know why my mind works this way but if you were in the ballistics lab circa 1985 and you also took the customer service calls did uh jason hornady ever work down there with you uh J- jason did i forget the exact year but he worked i think it was two years uh summers uh mm-hmm during college when he was going to college. So yeah, I worked with Jason, uh, uh, back when he was just a young guy. Yeah. Did you have him doing all kinds of cool stuff like sweeping the floor and, uh, I tried not to <laughs> try not to take too much advantage of him, but I'm sure he might have a different story. Yeah. What any, any, uh, anything funny or, uh, a notable that you care to share from uh, Jason's time down there in the lab well, with you? Other than he was late and I say it was his first day. He showed up late. He says it's his second day, so he might be right. I don't remember exactly, but late for work the one time, and then uh, then he was pretty punctual. So did you uh, let him know that he was late when he showed up? Well, of course, of course. <laughs> yep. <laughs> quick to help and quick to correct. That's great. Well, that's uh, quite a career you guys had, and to be truthful, we probably didn't even hit the wave tops of some of the really cool things that. Uh, that you guys helped with and was able to do and just just the amazing fact that you have nearly a century of combined work effort all for for one company and for one goal and um you know we obviously we the the company hornady you know owes you guys a, a debt of gratitude for for the effort and for uh yeah such such an amazing career but we talked about work, but let's talk about play because that's what we're all here for. We work so we can play. And uh, like I said, you guys aren't just workers. You guys are outdoorsmen. Uh, you're hunters. And so we should probably spend some time talking about some hunting escapades that uh, that have taken place over the years. So uh, you guys both started a long time ago, old timers. Uh, what was uh, what was some early hunting experiences that you guys remember and and maybe what products, if you could relate to what products you were using. I know you said, you, Mike, you were started deer hunting about the time you started. And, mm-hmm. well, it sounds like you've been doing it for a little longer than that. So what's some early hunting stuff that uh, that you remember? Oh, geez. Probably antelope. Is, antelope is one of the, probably one of the earlier ones. One of the earlier ones we uh, that was an out-of-state hunt in Wyoming. Yeah. Did you guys hunt together? We did. There was Mike and I and uh, Jesse Paris, who worked there at the mm-hmm. time also. He worked in the tool room. So yeah. three of us. It was eastern Wyoming. We had, we had deer and antelope tags. So went out, the three of us, and camped and uh, was quite a good time. Successful, and it was, it was a good hunt. It was a good hunt. Yeah, it was. What were you guys shooting back then? And this would have been in the early 80s, I'm guessing? Uh, that was, I think we were shooting, uh, I had... Uh, a uh, Thompson Center contender in 338 JDJ number two. Okay. That <laughs> okay. I, that I used. It was a little bit overkill on the antelope and yeah. probably the deer also, but uh, yeah. 
That's what I used. And of course, I used the 454 Kazool. <laughs> before the XTP? Huh? Before the XTP? Yeah, that was probably before the XTP. Or it's, have you always been well, a big revolver used, guy? Yeah, it was a 454 Kazool. Yeah, that so would have been 80. Been a, that would have been in 87 or somewhere okay, in so that, yeah. that would have been in the 80s. Okay. Yeah. Before that, we probably spent some bird hunting. We did. We did. We I think did. we started out bird hunting together was, was the first, hunting. yeah. You guys do much varmint shooting? Because back then, I know even back when I was growing up in central Nebraska, if you wanted to shoot prey dogs, you went and shot yes. prey dogs. But yes. now they're uh, kind of. Yeah, that was a standard thing every year. We'd go out and shoot prey dogs. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you could you could find, find some pretty good prey dog shooting in central Nebraska at that yeah. time. Yeah. That's awesome. So uh, what was your guys' early on anyway, before, before any big hunts that we'll talk about, when you were just an every man going to work, what was your favorite animal to pursue? For me, uh, mule deer is probably my, cause I, I, I love the spot and stock process of it. Not so much, not so much as stand hunter or tree stand. I did a little bit of that, you know, as a, as a bow hunter before that, but, uh, but I think my favorite is probably mule deer hunting. I'd have to say stuff. mule deer also. I mean, we don't have a lot of mule deer in central Nebraska, so it's kind of an exotic for us, mm -hmm. more or less. You know, a lot of a lot of good whitetail hunting in the area, so you know, kind of grew up doing doing that. But uh, um, had some relatives that lived in central Colorado, and my dad used to go out every year and hunt with his brother, would hunt mule deer. So that's mm -hmm. kind of how I got started, you know, and the kids would go out and we would, spend the the week that you know with the family and dad and uncle don would go out and do do a week-long hunt so i kind of got the itch to do it myself and and started shortly after i started work at hornaday making yep. some trips to colorado and wyoming to do that yeah. fantastic that's two slammer states to uh to uh to hunt mule deer in so i guess that leads me to a, a good question i guess so it's 2021 and with things like Onyx hunt maps and the go hunt stuff and, and there's, there's more people, maybe, maybe not. I don't know. I can't say that factually. There's a lot of people hunting, uh, let's say mule deer in Western States. And now it's taken, you know, with point creep places that you could hunt every year. Now it's two points or three points or four points. So in your guy's opinion, if mule deer's the, the, the animal on the menu, what were the glory days that that you you would consider the glory days of hunting that animal and maybe what state you know before point creep was nearly as bad as every year it was you know getting worse uh in the 80s and 90s uh in your experiences hunting mule deer was there a time where things were really good and the public land wasn't way over pressured and the deer populations were healthy and you didn't have to wait a bunch of years to draw a tag well we what we, year did we hunt out there in Gunnison? Was it? I don't remember. It was. Uh, <clears throat> you mean the last? We hunted. Uh, well, that was a point point thing there. Yeah, we had, we had several points build up, and and Colorado had had a one one year they did a, and I forget we had like seven Which, preference points I think build up, and Colorado had one year deal where if you drew a tag. And it took less points than you had to draw the tag. Then you could save those points. They took one point away from you, plus mm -hmm. what it took to draw the tag. And then the points that that you didn't need to draw that tag, you could use them oh, on the next them. year. So we okay. actually got to hunt two years. Yeah, the yep. point point banking. But I think that was like 2006, seven, I believe. Yeah, that's how, that's how, yeah. A, yeah. Then they had a yeah. big... Uh, Winter die off. We, we, we hunted kill. two years, and uh, deer population was, were tremendous out there at that time. You know, some big bucks, lots yeah. of yeah. lots of people were hunting it, and we hunted the two years in a row, had really good hunts both years, and the winter after our second hunt, they had a, had a terrible, terrible bad winter. Okay. And, and the deer really suffered. Mm -hmm. yeah, and yeah. it's not come back to that extent to... Okay. I mean, it's, it's been good in some years, but it's not come back to that extent. And that was shortly after, uh, not too long after Colorado had gone to uh, strictly limited draw 
draw basis for their deer tags. There were no over the counter deer tags, so mm. so it was it was good then. Yep. You know, probably not as good at the glory years were back before the you know, the sixties probably okay. back probably in much, there. Yeah, much later. Yeah. But uh it was it was good those years back. It was still in good up to yeah. up to then. I mean we were on a do it yourself or hunts, but you know and we went out ahead of time and scouted and Oh yeah. And what have you. You guys but, each killed dandy bucks? Yeah, we killed some dandy bucks out there a couple of a couple of years in a row. That's awesome. What was uh this is just more for me, uh on a personal note, what was hunting Nebraska like? Because that's where we're here, specifically for not necessarily mule deer, but specifically hunting spot and stock style in the West on our public land. Because there's whitetail everywhere, and and so if you're out way out west looking for a mule deer, there's a chance you're going to see a whitetail anyway out in the middle of absolutely nowhere in the sand hills. But what was Nebraska like for for all of our native listeners who have? Uh, who have braved the rifle season to hunt Nebraska public land. What was that like maybe in the eighties or nineties, if you guys did any of that? Oh, I did. We did uh, hunt. Of course, early, early on, I hunted with my uncles and stuff up North and, and kind of learned that it was kind of a hunt that was not so much for me. I wanted to be more spot and stock, more solo type stuff where it was kind of a, you know, everybody goes out and, bop through the pastures and you're all together it, so i i kind of split off on that and, and started hunting some of the public lands and yeah it was much better i mean we didn't have near the out-of-staters back then that we do we do now and uh and the numbers of people i guess but of course we don't have a, a great deal of, of public land mm -hmm. in nebraska so it's it makes it a little difficult unless you've got private land to sure. on. I, I started, uh, one of my brother-in-laws, uh, grew up in a little town north of Grand Island and, uh, had access and knew, knew a lot of the farms and oh, sure. knew the farm owners. So, you know, he, a lot of places you'd go and yeah, go ahead. You know, you'd, you'd ask and say, yeah, you just go ahead. And, you know, and we'd, a lot of it was, we do a lot of, uh, just walking draws, walking brushy draws and that kind of stuff. Not a lot of stand hunting at that time. Okay. Was, I don't think stand hunting was, was nearly as big as it no. is now. You didn't see a lot of tree stands or big box blinds or, in fact, box blinds, none. I can't remember any box no. blinds at that uh -uh. time. So and it, it was it was easier to get permission to hunt. Uh, yeah. People were more receptive to it, uh, you know, plus with someone that grew up in the area and knew a lot of the guys too. So. Yeah, that helps. So nowadays it's, hunting has become a lot of, it's kind of a big business, you know, business anymore. So yep. there's a lot of lease ground, which you can't blame people. I mean, if you want a, a spot to hunt, uh, if you can afford to lease a piece of ground, you know, that's, that's the way to go. And I, nothing against that. The landers, landowners need to, to make profit too. So, I mean, but it just, it's got tougher. Sure. Well, that's, uh, that's good insight. Cause yeah, like I said, I know, uh now with it seems like point creep everybody talks about it but man to to get a quote unquote good hunt i mean you're you're putting at least a year or two in but yeah the days of maybe over the counter or one point drawing kind of a a, a good place to go with decent public lands getting harder and harder and harder uh, we, we started uh collecting points for colorado for elk elk and deer both at the time but yep. uh uh, we started, uh, there was a particular magazine article that came out about elk hunting in northwestern Colorado. And uh, they didn't name the unit, but you could pretty much tell exactly where it was from mm -hmm. the bits of inf information that were in the article. So, you know, I got the idea that we need to start collecting points yeah. for elk and yeah. deer in Colorado. So, you know, at that time it was like two points, three points to get into this area. So we started collecting points, and the points just kept climbing because there were there were thousands of other people that read the same article. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So it just kept climbing, and we ended up, uh, what do we have, 16 points, I think, when we finally— I thought we was almost 18. 16, maybe 17 points when we finally bailed on the original idea to hunt these specific units yeah. and, and oh, went yeah, okay. down you know, a, a tier lower, still— a, Still a fantastic yeah. hunt. Let's yeah. talk about that hunt a little bit. I think, you know, the, the elk hunt you guys are talking about, um, 
What was that like? Yeah, talk about that one a little bit. Well, it was in western Colorado. Actually, oh. I'm not going to – the unit. Yeah. But uh, we uh, finally decided we were going to lower expectations unit-wise, you know, and, and go the next tier down. And, and we were going to do it on our own. Yeah, you know, we just were going to do, we do it yourself. Or- a do it yourself on, you know, we had enough experience, but we weren't familiar with the area at all. So came right down to it. Just, I think with just two or three months, maybe before the hunt was ready to go. And Mike ran across somebody that had hunted and hunted with a, a guide with an outfit out there. Yeah. Yeah. It was, uh, was in Dallas, I guess at the DSC show. Yeah. And I bumped into a guy there. I was just asking about, because we had these, tags and we were gonna or that took us 17 we years were to, ready to, to go draw. and uh, anyway he dropped a name of a rancher out there that does elk hunts and stuff there as well so so it was like uh, so the last minute i called him and he said you know i got room for two guys yeah. shot us a great deal i mean it was it was a no-brainer it's like yeah we're i'm I'm in. I'm, I'll talk to the law, but I'm pretty damn sure we're in. You yeah, know, so. you wait that long to draw a tag. Yeah, so yeah. so and off we went. Yeah, that was a great, uh, it was turned They're out to be a really great. Far hunt. exceeded our expectations. A lot of yep. bulls out there, a lot of, or a lot of elk in general? A lot, elk. lot of elk. We saw elk. a lot, a lot of elk, yeah. Yeah, That's yeah we, we both killed our bulls within probably a couple of hours on the same day. Yeah, yeah. That was kind of funny because... Because we told him, we said, well, we normally kill on like the fourth day. <laughs> That's what we had done on uh, on mule deer hunts and stuff like that. About the fourth day is usually about the day we killed. So I says, well, we get about for about the fourth day. Maybe we'll get serious. We'll get serious. And sure enough, fourth day we we both kill different parts of the. We two, were two, two different guys. Two so different we're in guides, different areas. Different areas. We were in different part, different further away. Mm-hmm. And when we got done killing them, you know, and we were, the guides were radioing back to camp saying, hey, uh, uh, we got a bull down. And my, my guide radioed, radioed back to camp and said, uh, hey, you guys maybe ought to be there when we roll in with this bull. And, and yeah. then Mike's guide popped off. Popped yeah, off you guys says, probably ought to be me. there when we get there, too. <laughs> you both killed yeah. slammers, obviously. We, we both yeah. killed slammers, and we're thinking, you know, we're... Me and my guides thinking, well, well, they're going to be surprised when they see this because this is one of the best bulls they bring in home in this camp, you know. And then Lowell's guide and stuff was thinking the same thing, you know. They they killed the same one. Well, it turned out Lowell, Lowell's was bigger than mine, but they were both great uh, bulls. We, we rolled in. Mike, Mike and his guide had got there before <laughs> us, and, you know, they're getting all the pats on the backs. And yeah. nice, nice, nice bull, you know. Yeah. And, yeah. So we rolled in and backed up to the shed. and. Uh, Mike walks up, people walking up, and Mike walks up, and I remember him saying, Lowell. <laughs> <laughs> that was that an was, incredible bull. Yeah, though. they were both really, really good bulls. Like I say, it far exceeded our expectations. Well, that's great to hear, and I'm guessing you guys got big shoulder mounts in your homes to yeah. re- to remember them. Yeah, I've got a pedestal yep. mount that I don't have room for, but <laughs> yeah, it's a pretty, pretty, pretty well dominates the room. Yeah, yeah. well, that's... And, I got a big pedestal mount too. That's you deserve it after yeah all the all the years of waiting and stuff. Uh, Lowell, what were you shooting for again? What did you shoot them with? Three hundred wind mag. I used the one sixty five GMX bullet. The GMX bullet, a Mike Jensen special. Yep. Mike, what'd you shoot? Uh, the I was a three hundred wind mag too. Now the rifle I shot uh, didn't like the one sixty five. Matter of fact, we uh, we'd shot we tried even hand loading it and I'll be darned if it would, it just didn't group it very well. Mm-hmm. So I tried the uh, super performance 150 GMX bullet, shot it great. Shot just, yeah. shot it just lights out. So I'm like, that's what you'll shoot. It, that uh, it's plenty of tough enough bullet for an elk. It's a little Absolutely. on the light side, but it's plenty tough enough. So mm-hmm. I used the 150. That's cool. And you mentioned that 300 wind mag real quick. Let's talk about that 300 wind mag. Cause I've heard this story. I've seen the rifle and that's, that's a pretty cool rifle. If you wouldn't mind, uh, filling our listeners in on about the history of that particular rifle. The one that I, the one that I hunted with, mm-hmm. well, that was a rifle that I bought 
from it was a it's a Ruger. It's a 200 deer Ruger that I bought in 76, I think right after I started there. And uh and I I wanted to customize it, so I took and carved the stock way down and ground it and changed this and that. Inlaid some wood on and the cheek I piece. I inlaid and... some wood in the cheek piece and I I just did a bunch of stuff and then hand checkered it and refinished it. My dad fell in love with it, so so I turned around and, and uh give it to my dad for Christmas after that. And then of course because he would uh, he'd always wanted to elk hunt for his whole life, you know. And he had a guy out there that would uh an outfitter that would take him hunting. And I told him, I said, here's a rifle, just you just call him up and go do and it tell him the first chance you got you get in there and go and uh and he him hauled around and and later on well of course he got he got uh sick and then got to the point where he, he wasn't able to do it and lo and behold uh he uh passed which uh he wound i wound up with a rifle back and that's why so i had a better i mean i had a nice I had a nice new fancy rifle that I could take, but I, I could, uh, I couldn't do it. I had to, Gotta I had baptize to, it. I had to take that rifle because he's always wanted to kill an elk with it. And I thought, well, this is going to be the rifle that I'm going to take. That's cool. So, and yeah, the whole killed a bull, nice bull. Yeah. It's a neat story. And, and, like you said, when you started uh, the podcast that you were just a punk kid coming into Hornady to work as a punk kid with a 300 wind mag, you milled the shit out of that stock. I mean, <laughs> that thing, I would have been like, this is a brand new rifle and the inlays and, and the checkering, it wasn't just a punk kid carving up on a stock. That thing looks really nice. I was, I'm, it, I would, people pay money to have that stuff done. And have that quality come out the way it did, and for you to have done that in the seventies, uh, that it just was cool. And no training, just not afraid no, to uh, carve just, on some stuff. Just and make dove it work. into it and cut on it. Did, I, did you ever see the high dollar shotgun that he did the same thing to? Yeah, I, uh, carved on the stock. The on stock it. on the shotgun was probably a little more expensive. What was oh. that? A Caesar Garini or something? Yeah, it was Caesar Garini. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> You're just yeah. carving away on the stock and made it fit him better. Well, so. it didn't fit me quite there, so I I changed it. Well, so your your machinist skills goes past woodworking and uh, well, or and past then, metalworking into woodworking. And uh, and that four seventy five line ball, that uh, Freedom Arms four seventy five. So it's a pretty nice gun, and Dad poured it on the end, and I decided I didn't want it that long, and I I wanted to put a different grip on and change the changed the bottom of it and so i just sawed the barrel off <laughs> took it up took it in there and took it apart and sawed the barrel off and shortened it up and made a new front sight for it or a new barrel band sight for it and, and a fancy top uh sight that fit into the into the slot up on top and it was i styled it after the old double rifles one of those we had a leaf sight, you know. That's that's cool. But yeah, they were kind of freaking out on when I was <laughs> when I was over there on the grinder grinding that no, grinding on that brand new pistol. Oh my gosh! But it came out all right, I guess. In yeah, the end. I'm sure it did. It came out well. Yeah, probably yeah. Came out nicer than when it got to you and from the factory. Uh, so that was that's a, that's a cool uh, a cool elk hunt story, and and obviously the the gunsmithing work of of Whitey is stuff of legend so that's uh just here locally where where have your hunts taken you guys uh not just together but separately where where have you guys all been and, and running around shooting stuff well a lot of it's together a lot of us that. together we went made a trip to australia together to hunt yeah. water buffalo we weren't entirely successful on that no. but we had a great time we had a good time though had a good time Killed one buffalo we took a trip to new zealand after stag and mike Killed a tar also. Was yeah, a good hunt. That was fun. Some adventures and we've kind of split up. Mike has kind of got the mountain hunting bug, well, so he's yeah. he wanting to do yeah. sheep and goats and 
I'm more more mule deer tuned toward mule deer in Africa a little bit. So okay. we've kinda, yeah, that's kind of where we split up a little bit after that because I I I've gotten a little addicted to Alaska. So the last three years I've been going to Alaska hunting. And what have you taken in Alaska? Uh, first one was a uh, was a doll sheep. That was so. Uh, that no was, easy feat. Yeah, that's another level of hunting. You know that. You know I like spot stock, and and that's that's probably the pinnacle of spot and stock. Yeah. I can see where, you know, if you got deep enough pockets, it, because it to do the grand slam type thing, it takes really deep pockets, but. But I could see being a, of course, you got to need to start young when you're, yeah. when you're sheep hunting because it's, it's tough, but yeah, you get up on the top of a mountain and cause they like the top third. So yeah, <laughs> that's so, where you got to go. <laughs> so that's where you got to go. But, uh, but that's, that's quite a, quite a hunt there. Yeah. And then, uh, hunted, then I applied for mountain goat, which I had been applying in Montana for years and years. And one year, I, you know, of course, young kid started at work, and this has been quite a number of years ago. But young kid started there and, and uh, wanted to go mountain goat hunting. And I'm like, well, I've been applying in Montana. I said, you can start applying. I said, good luck. You know, it probably won't draw. And he, he said, so he applied first year he draws this tag oh god and so i'm like you know and he's like well i drew this tag but i don't know if i you know i might need help i don't I'm sure i can you know i might want to i don't know if i can do it on my own i said if you draw a tag of course before he drew the tag i told him if you draw a tag i will go with you i don't care i'll go i'll, mm -hmm. tell, I'll tag along and tag along, and so I did. We tag along, went up into crazy peaks of Montana, and and climbed up in the big slide, killed a mountain goat. Boy, that was one of the toughest hunts I ever done, <laughs> and I didn't even hunt. <laughs> I just <laughs> it's a good carry, friend carrying that mountain goat off of that mountain was a was quite a task. But so that's where I that's where I got addicted into the mountain goat hunting stuff or the mountain goat sheep hunting. So after I sheep hunted, I tried to apply for mountain goat in Alaska because I just give up on a Montana. On Montana, I'd been applying for fifteen, twenty years. I just couldn't do it anymore. And uh, finally, two years in in Alaska, I didn't draw. Didn't draw the the Kodiaks. And then I tried in the Tugach Mountains. Didn't draw the Tugach. But bumped into another guy in the at Dallas at the Safari Club show, you know, Ron Warren, and uh, and he said I can get you a tag. You can come and hunt on the coast down there by Yakutak and the glaciers. So I said, well, if I don't draw, I'm calling you. So he, so I, I didn't draw. So I called him up, and yeah, off we went mountain goat hunting and Yakutak. So that was. I was pretty, pretty special, but, uh, and then one year that I didn't draw the mountain goat before that, uh, I called, called an outfitter back up that I'd hunted on, hunt my sheep with, and, and I didn't kill a moose with him because I, I had a moose tag as well when I was there. So I didn't, that first year that I didn't draw a mountain goat, I called him up and he's like, I got, I got room for you to come moose hunt, so. So I went back and shot a moose with him. Wow. Yeah, addicted to Alaska. It sounds like uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, that bug has bitten you. So what's what's next for you guys hunting-wise? What are you looking forward to on the on the hunting scene? Well, you got anything planned coming up you're looking forward to? No big plans. You know, I'd like to like to get back to Africa again. Okay. Uh, but nothing this fall. I didn't, uh, didn't draw any tags this fall. So we'll do a little bit of bird hunting around here, me and the old dog, and try and find a rooster pheasant or two. Perfect, Mike. Where are you where are you looking forward to? Well, uh, the, when, I, when I went moose hunting there with Eric, uh, he, I was I was wanting to do it with a handgun. Well, turned out it didn't wind up coming together with a handgun. We got close, but just just wound up taking that moose with a rifle. So my my goal, my long term goal, is to kill is to harvest a a moose with the handgun, but 
I also got a goal of taking each one of my children. I've got two sons and two daughters, and they, and all four of them, love to hunt. Yeah, they're just as adamant, just as eager about it as I am, I guess. But uh, infected, you could call so, it. So yeah, infected, I guess. But so my my plan is, I, I we applied my youngest daughter for moose up on the Yukon River up in Alaska. And so we're going to, and I've got a moose tag as well. So we're going to go try to back to Alaska moose. and try to, try to harvest a couple of moose. That'll be, that'll be cool. It's, that's a, uh, uh, hunting related. Now you guys, like I had mentioned earlier, no offense, the old timers, what are you, what are you guys looking for forward to just in life? Maybe not specific to hunting, anything you guys are looking forward to now i mean you've worked your asses off for a long time uh, anything you're you're excited to do oh yes i guess there's i've still got a list of stuff that i want to hunt but okay <laughs> so it's so there's <laughs> it I, is hunting sometime eventually i'd probably like to go to La- africa following Maybe get Lowell to go back out there. There you maybe go. We'll get, maybe we'll go together or I've something. I've been, been trying to talk you into it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'd, I'd but, like to go back. I, I hunted Cape Buffalo three years ago. I'd like to go back and do that again. Sweet. Cape Buffalo and, and some Plains game too. So I had a really good time on that hunt. Uh, I'd like to do. I'd like to do more fishing. Yeah. yeah I'd like to do some saltwater fishing. You okay. Know, maybe. Yeah, big maybe stuff. Maybe some uh, Alaska halibut, salmon in Alaska, and some Gulf Coast stuff too. So do a little bit more fishing than I have been. Cool. Uh, got some got some preference points in Wyoming still to burn too. So Yeah, I've got all but, I think, two shy of max points in Wyoming on elk, deer, and antelope, I guess. so. And the, the bighorn sheep burn. application period for Nebraska is coming right up yeah. too so yeah, there's be, always always that chance somebody's got to win it I'll somebody's got to draw that, that. yeah yes. well, i'm sorry to let you guys know but i'm gonna win it this year so if you guys <laughs> just want to wait a year i'll <laughs> take this uh, <laughs> all right uh well maybe i got enough enough life left in me to wait a year or two <laughs> <laughs> awesome well i really appreciate you guys uh just taking the time to sit down and i know some people don't appreciate or don't quite conceptualize how how much reach a podcast can have, but I can I can guarantee you there's going to be a lot of people that like to have the uh, to to hear about things from a different perspective and your perspective. And so, uh, on behalf of everybody who's ever enjoyed a Hornady product over the last 45 years, um, I want to thank you guys for for everything that you've done for the company and j- the industry as a whole. And and that there's something to be said there with Lowell with all the work on Superformance and Lever Evolution and all the cartridges and Mike the XTP bullet for example all the 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 stones that started rolling because of those developments and how that has snowballed you know the industry is better because of it and uh, you know we really appreciate your your effort and your work ethic and there's definitely something to be said there about um, you know we thank you for coming to work every day putting your nose to the stone for 40 plus years uh and not just at work but at work with passion and with purpose doing something that you love so it's really appreciated and uh i can't thank you guys enough well thank you absolutely thank you it's an easy company to work for so it's an easy yeah Yeah. 40 years went by pretty quickly it did pretty quickly yeah, when you got management and people that have the same ideas and mm-hmm. and and the same goals and or you see their goals and it it makes you want to do more for for the company as well too. So awesome. Well, again, thank you and everybody out there. Thanks for tuning in with us today. I hope you enjoyed the insight from uh, these two old timers who have been there and done that. And uh, we'll catch you on the next one.